welcome to this course on randomized methods. in computational complexity theory. Okay, so this uh, as the title suggests this will be a course uh, slightly more advanced than complexity theory, but I do not expect you to have done this course on complexity theory. I just expect you to know something about algorithms and something about uh, Turing machines and some probability. So based on those three things and maybe algebra will also help, you will be able to understand this course. So what we will study in this course, so this course will study computational problems. and their complexity. Okay, so, the two things are problems and then their complexity and these problems will be computational problems which is slightly different from mathematical problems or uh, other types of problems you face in everyday life. So, here computational means that there is a precise input and there is a precise output. Okay, a string is input, a string is output and uh, that is what you want to achieve as fast as possible. So that is what complexity will formalize and uh, randomization in the title refers to probabilistic methods. or random objects okay so random objects pseudo random objects probabilistic methods probability these things will be key in this course so it is necessary to have some intuition about probability okay so today i will not go into the details of anything i will just give you a list of uh, topics and objects and tools that this course will expand upon. Okay, so, this is only a lecture to give you the overview. So, the course will cover the following topics or at least uh, the initial ones and then depending on time we can do more things. So, course covers the following topics. So, first is uh, algorithms, okay, but this is not an algorithms course. So, we will not really do everything in algorithms, but just uh, the notion of algorithms. Okay, what is an algorithm? What is a problem? What is an algorithm? What is a solution? So, what are the upper and lower bounds? And uh, there is a, a different way to formalize computation which is called circuit. So, we will use this extensively circuits. Okay, this circuit should remind you of electronic circuits something which is used uh, to make a computer right. So, that we will formalize that and use it mathematically. So, algorithms lower bounds and circuits. Next is uh, expanders, so what is an expander? At this point it will be hard to define, but expander is just think of it as a graph with uh, high connectivity 
or uh, to be precise high reachability okay so it is a graph where uh, if you take a few random steps then you can reach almost anywhere with equal probability okay so if there are n vertices you want to design a graph where there are n vertices and the edges are such so you also want to minimize the number of edges but they should be distributed such that in log in random steps you should be able to reach uh, every vertex with equal probability or almost equal probability. So these are optimally connected graphs. Okay, so expanders are essentially it is a graph construction. Okay, so we will look at such constructions and we will study it very rigorously. This is a beautiful and a very useful theory that we will develop. Something else that we will develop and is even more important is what is called a pseudo random generator. So we will shorten it to PRG. So what are these? So these are uh, functions, these are Boolean functions, the output of which looks random. Okay. So this also means that uh, for a low computational device, it will be very hard to predict the values of these functions. Okay. For that computational device, it will be a hard function, right? because if it was not hard, then a small computational device can actually predict the values. So this in particular also means that this will be a hard function and its output in particular will look random to low computational devices. And this is a very useful object. This is uh, something on which a lot of uh, what you do in security cryptography is based on. So these are Boolean functions. That look random. Okay, which means hard to predict. So we have to formalize this, we have to define this and then we have to see whether these things exist and how fast can you compute them. Next is error correcting codes. This is hugely important. In fact, it is so important that if these things error correcting codes did not exist then none of your uh, electronic machinery will exist. Okay, the intelligent electronic machinery, computers, smartphones, communication, everything depends on correction of errors. There is the physical devices have a lot of errors. For example, hard disk has a lot of errors. So you still have to store correct information. You still have to correct the errors. Okay, obviously up to a limit, you cannot if the errors are more than 50 percent for example or 50 percent then you cannot then it is impossible to correct but suppose the errors are less than 50 percent like 45 percent on your hard disk then can you store information in such a way that it can be recovered safely and correctly. So we will see a lot of uh, such constructions. So these will be uh, again functions based on mostly actually the best constructions are algebraic. So these are Boolean or algebraic functions that spread the essence of a string.
okay so a string whatever information that string contains you basically want to spread that duplicate that put some redundancy introduce some redundancy and then store it on a hard disk so that even if uh, a part of the hard disk gets corrupted still you can recover that essence of the string right so it is about the diffusion or the spreading of the information so those kind of boolean functions right how can we do they exist if they exist can we construct them if we can construct them how much of error can they correct or can they handle we'll see all of that and finally extractors so what are extractors so extractors are boolean functions that can extract randomness from an impure source so it basically takes in a pseudo random function which may have lots of bits but the randomness is only in few places okay so what this extractor function does is it extracts those few places okay so it the the ambient space it compresses and then gives you a more pure form of randomness so this is very vague but we will formalize this and then we'll see whether these things exist and how to construct them and if we have time then we can do more things but usually i have seen that these topics are already a lot if you are interested in uh, reading a book together with this course then a recommended textbook is aroda and barak the name of the book is complexity theory a modern approach okay so that's the textbook if you have not done a computational complexity theory course this book is highly recommended the initial 7 chapters of this will give you the basics of complexity theory and this course builds on that on that formalism at least we will not need all the theorems and results but the formalism the definitions we will of course need and then these advanced objects and lower bound results we will discuss in this course okay that is the part that comes in the book after chapter 8 so when this course is taught in iit the grading policy is that uh, 25% weightage is given to assignments then there is a mid sem exam Thirty percent, and there is an end sem exam. That is forty percent. These will all be take home. It's an advanced course. Questions will take longer time than three hours, so I usually give it as a take home exam. And the remaining five percent and maybe bonus marks. Okay, that is for if you are in the class, if you are attending this by a physical class, then participation or ex if you gave an extra talk, or if you prepared an extra report. Okay, that is the usual grading policy in a usual class. In NPTEL, it will be slightly different, which you can 
see from NPTEL rules. The lecture notes are also available, they are already available on the home page. So, you can check at my CSE home page, CSE IIT Kanpur home page under teaching.html. So, you can get lecture notes for CS 747, okay. I have taught it many times and every time there are some changes. So, you can look at the most recent one. Those lecture notes are in PDF, so you can easily download it and read it. If you want something with the video, then it is a good option. And also if you need to read about other courses in particular complexity theory, that is also available and you can have a look. So, it is also good for other courses. So, CS 640 is the course that comes before this particular course. That is the administrative part and the overview. Let us now do some formalization which will be necessary for this course. It will remind you if you have done a course on complexity theory and if you have not done any such course then it will introduce you very quickly into the basics on which complexity theory builds up. So, everyone here has already done uh, theory of computation. So, it is basically some part of theory of computation that I will quickly remind you. So, let us formalize problems and difficulty. So, what is a problem? So, in computer science problem is just a set of strings, okay. And Boolean strings, because computer essentially only understands uh, on or off, which is 1 or 0, right, true or false. So, everything that is happening in computer science is actually ultimately implemented as just a string. Inputs are Boolean strings and uh, output is also a Boolean string. So, input problem is basically a set of strings and this is what we call a decision problem. Let me also specify that. or it is called a language. So, when you uh, model a decision problem as a language or as a set L, the strings which are in the set they are called the yes strings and the ones which are not in L are called the no strings, okay. So, you are dividing the space into yes or no and you are and obviously the problem then is to distinguish given a string how do you find out whether it is yes or no. So, that is a decision problem. Now, what is the meaning of solving a problem? So, solution to a problem is in this course it will mean which it means which is also true for computer science in general. We call a problem computable call it computable if there is a Turing machine. We will shorten it to T m. So, if there is a Turing machine solving it. Okay, so, that is when we say that a problem is solvable that uh, deciding whether a string is in the language or not that can be done by a 
a Turing machine decider. I will not define Turing machine, this you have already seen in great detail and also you have seen models weaker than Turing machine like finite automaton, non-deterministic finite automaton, push down stack and so on. So, I will not go into all that, that really needs a course in itself. I will just say that Turing machine is an abstraction of real computers. And in fact, any computing device known to us. Okay, so, any computing device and specially real computers, they are all abstracted by a Turing machine. Okay, so, this is how you should remember it in this course. So, whenever I say algorithm solution problem, I am talking about Turing machines, okay, solving it. Computable problems are also called uh, decidable or recursive. Okay, so, these are decidable is a standard term, computable and decidable are interchangeable. A recursive is an older term. Okay, recursive comes from logic, but they all mean the same for us, which is also the same as the, there being an algorithm there exists an algorithm. Okay, so, so, these terms will really mean the same thing. So, when you write a C program or a Java program that is an algorithm and that it is also a Turing machine okay. and the problem you are solving by the C program that problem is decidable, recursive, computable. That is how we will talk about it. So, now let us look at uh, some famous problems, okay, concrete problems. In computer science, so suppose you are given a quadratic polynomial. the polynomial has n variables and it is an integral polynomial, okay. coefficients are integers. So, you are given an integral polynomial and the question is whether there is an integral root. And a simple example for this is so x1 minus x2 square has a root. So, if you take x1 to be 4, then you can take x2 to be minus 2, right. That is an example. So, uh, you are given say some complicated polynomial f like this or much more complicated than this and the question is whether there is an integral root. So, this problem is also called uh, Diophantine problem. Okay, so, think about this, how will you solve this and uh, you can make it even more complicated by considering a polynomial system. So, not just one f, but many polynomials are given, you want a common integral root. Ok, 
कि दिस एक्स बार और वेरिएबल्स एक्स वन टू एक्स एन यूज द सेम यूज द इंटरचेंजेबली सो यू आर गिवेन एम क्वाड्रेटिक पोलॉमियल्स इन एन वेरिएबल्स फाइंड एन इंटीग्रल जीरो of f1 equal to f2 equal to fm equal to 0 okay so it's a polynomial system whether there is an integral zero and if there is then find it so it's a very famous problem with a history of around 120 years it's called hilbert's 10th problem okay so the question that hilbert asked is uh, whether there is an algorithm for this hoping that there indeed is an algorithm okay you just have to find it now note that th there are infinitely many integers right so the space of integral zeros which satisfy f1 equal to 0 f2 equal to 0 this is uh, infinite and how do you search in an infinite space right so even a brute force algorithm is not clear so it was shown uh, after 50 years of this problem being posed that this cannot be solved it's an uncomputable problem so so problem number 1 is computable in exponential time okay this is not easy to see but uh, somehow it can be solved in exponential time while problem number 2 is uncomputable okay so with one polynomial uh, there is still hope of doing it but with the many polynomials this just becomes impossible there is no algorithm right so the way you prove this is you pick some uncomputable problem like halting problem and reduce it to this okay again this i won't be able to cover the details but you can have a look at the literature if you are interested so whenever we say something is computable then we have to show an algorithm right so for a computable problem for a computable problem l the step by step procedure of its turing machine this is called an so a computable problem has a turing machine and the turing machine steps they give you an algorithm that's the algorithm so this can be uh, written in as a c program or java program or python or whatever right then a computer can execute it so let us now move to the uh, complexity part so like i said problem number 1 is exponential time right so this basically means that uh, the turing machine or the algorithm the number of steps there grows extremely fast in terms of the input size something like 2 raised to n or worse right so as soon as you have a turing machine definition you can specify time and space and other resources so the number of steps okay this is called time complexity
and the number of uh, cells on the Turing machine. This is called space complexity. Okay, so, both time and space has been mathematically formalized. Let me give you an example of a, a decision problem versus functional problem. Okay, so, so, decision problem L is a subset of strings, while a functional problem functional problem will be a function from strings to strings. Okay, so, we will also sometimes use this qualification whether a problem is decision or functional. So, decision would mean that uh, uh, the output is yes or no 0 or 1 also called Boolean problem functional problem will be output will be a string. So, for example, in problem 1 right when we are looking for uh, integral roots. So, if you just ask for uh, whether there uh, integral root exists right. So, then the answer will be yes or no. So, that is a Boolean problem. So, the input string is uh, description of f. So, the coefficients and the output is yes, yes or no whether there is an integral root or not. Functional problem will be or functional version of this problem will be that uh, give me an integral root. Okay, then you the, your output will also be a string. So, that is the distinction. So, once I have defined uh, let us say decision problem I can look at a collection of problems that is called complexity class. Okay, so, I looked at first I started with bits, bit collection of bits I called a string, collection of strings I call a language or a problem and now collection of problems I call complexity class. So, you must have seen a few one or two complexity classes like polynomial time for example, you must have seen exponential time uh, in theory of computation. Let me just remind you. So, examples of complexity classes. So, it makes sense to define complexity classes with respect to some resource, most common resource is time or space. Okay. So, you can say that all the problems that are solvable in time n or n square I collect them. So, these will be like easy problems. So, in general let uh, t be a function and n be the input bit size. which we also denote like this okay, bar of x. So, in terms of the input bit size, so how many bits there are in the input, in terms of that you can define this complexity class 
d time t n think of t n as uh, n square right. So, then we are looking at d time n square and so on. So, collect all the problems which are solvable in this much time. So, all the languages or problems L such that there is a Turing machine that tests whether x is in L or not in T of x time. Okay, so, that is how we collect problems. So, problems that have similar complexity, time complexity right. So, all these problems they are solvable in T of size of x time, but there is a big O. So, recall the asymptotic notation big O means that uh, the number of steps of the Turing machine will be some constant times T. Similarly, there is big omega. So, which means at least constant times t and there is a big theta. So, when you have both upper and lower bounds ok. So, recall your asymptotics and that defines d time. Once you have d time you can create a lot of new classes. So, polynomial time is union of d time n to the c for all c ok. So, we are allowing uh, the time to grow as a polynomial power of n, n n square n cube go over every integer positive integer. So, that is polynomial time. and uh, you can give more time. So, E union d time 2 raise to c n, where c is again positive real. This is called simply exponential time. that is E x is more time it is d time 2 raise to n raise to c ok. So, this is exponential in n to the c for some constant c go over all constants. So, all these problems so these are a lot of problems some very hard problems sit here this is exponential time. Then there is a sub exp which is the intersection of these. So, sub exponential time. So, as the name tells you it is about uh, so time complexity of these problems is uh, 2 raise to something where the something is smaller than every n to the c right. So, what is an example of this? An example is d time. So, a problem that has time complexity may be 2 raise to log square n right. So, 2 raise to log square n. So, log square n is smaller than every n to the c. So, a problem with this much time complexity is in sub exp. Yeah, you can go on there are many ways of defining complexity classes. So, another way is by using non deterministic Turing machines, where the Turing machine transition function Turing machine can make a choice ok, then it is called non deterministic. So, those classes are called n time not d time.
non deterministic Turing machine based algorithms. Okay, so, these use uh, NTM instead of TM non deterministic Turing machine just like you must have seen non deterministic finite automaton. So, that kind of non determinism you give to Turing machine and then you define classes. So, the key thing there is as I just said they can guess bits. to solve a problem. Okay, so, if the steps are not fixed the machine can actually make choices. So, as we did before you will get the complexity classes for p you will get n p e will become any x will become n x sub x will become sub next. So, this is by the resource of time, but you can also do this by the resource of space and finally, you can also do it by the resource of randomization random bits right computers can also flip a coin and then take decisions. So, that will give you a different set of complexity classes. Let us quickly go through that because you will be seeing those. So, similarly we can define a space T n based on the space. by the best Turing machine. So, then you get this class which is uh, L is the class of uh, log space solvable problems. For polynomial space, you will get p space and exponential space, you will get x space. Okay, so, these are the space classes that we will be talking about. We can also use probabilistic Turing machines. where the where Turing machine in one step where a step may use random coins. So, this is uh, similar to non deterministic Turing machine, but also very different. So, in non deterministic Turing machine also a choice is made, but there was no random coin flipping. In probabilistic Turing machine there is an actual random coin flipping and then uh, the path or the step is taken. Okay, so, out of two steps one step is taken by looking at the coin whether it is head or tails. And then the answer which is obtained should have a guarantee of correctness that is the that so it is a bigger demand here. So, the final answer is required to be correct with high probability. 